Well, I think we've crossed the Rubicon. Um, I personally was never someone who took elections particularly seriously, at least not not in my adult life. Um, you know, I am <clears throat> I'm in my early twenties, um, but in the time that I've been uh, legally able to vote, so not not a whole whole of a lot of time, I haven't taken our, our political system particularly seriously. I, I've thought that it was a sham uh, since I was in high school. But I think that what happened um, yesterday, last night, really solidifies that. What ha this whole election um, in general really has convinced me that not only is um, uh, American democracy in theory a sham, um, in that you know for the reasons I've talked about, structural reasons why you can't really have a, you can't have this system where 350 million people vote every four years to elect a king who makes all decisions everywhere in the country. Um, you know I, I've thought for a long time that that was in theory, excuse me, in theory, not a good idea. But now I mean this the the elect that was not even taking into account um, the idea that the elections themselves. Uh, were a total fraud and were a sham. And to me, what what happened last night takes my disdain for American democracy to a whole new level. And I think that a lot that a lot of Americans who would have never been inclined to think the way that I do um, are are going to be shaken by what happened last night. And of course, what I'm referring to uh, is the uh, the harassment. Of the Wayne of the two Republican members of the Wayne County Canvas Board in Michigan, uh, who refused to certify the results, um, because, well, there's a lot of funny business that looks like it was going on in in Detroit, and they say, you know what, <laughs> we don't feel comfortable signing off on this. Uh, we think that this that these results should not be certified because you know we we can't we can't uh, vouch uh, for their veracity. A very reasonable uh, and and not extreme position, at the very least. Um, these people, however, uh, were uh, viciously attacked online. They were doxxed. Their children were doxxed. They were, you know, they had death threats. Um, and <laughs> you have to remember, these people live in Wayne County, which is Detroit. They might not live in the city center, but you know, if you live in the same county as Detroit, I'd imagine that with all this stuff going on, you'd feel pretty nervous. It's a very high crime area. Um, there's a lot of bad hombres uh, who might want to do you harm. And if everyone knows where to find you, if they know where to find your children, um, if they know who you are, and they have a reason to hate you, uh, I would be scared to death. I, w I would do anything to make that stop if I were in their position, probably. And so I'm not going to come out here and slam them and say that, oh my god, they caved, they didn't stand with Trump, blah, blah, blah. No, <laughs> these people, uh, this, was not a, this is not a political issue at this point. Uh, but by what it had turned into at first, they said, you know, they, they made, I think, a very honest case that, hey, <laughs> we can't vouch for this. We don't think that these results are 100 percent accurate. Uh, there are more votes than voters. That doesn't add up. Uh, we need we need to look into this a little deeper. And then uh, their lives uh, were threatened and their families' lives were threatened. Uh, credibly, very credibly, uh, by Antifa, BLM, and probably even just mainstream Democratic activists in the area uh, who did not like them questioning these results. And so we're at the point in this country to where, you know, even if there is monkey business going on or, or some impropriety uh, or something like that going on with the elections, you're not allowed to question that. I mean, we now live in a country where even the people whose job it is uh, to comb over the election and to make sure that it was done properly and to make sure that there was no uh, that there was nothing amiss going on with the election, if those people are um, harassed and you know beyond bullied uh, into just doing whatever the mob wants, then <laughs> you have you don't even have a democracy. Even even though I thought that democracy is a bad model for the United States. Um, it was a bad form of government. You don't even have that anymore. If there's not even allowed to be even the slightest check on a potential election fraud in this country, then <laughs> the elections have zero integrity. If there's no channel by which um, people can raise concerns over how an election was conducted, <laughs> then the elections 
have zero integrity. And so I don't know how uh, Americans moving forward, and, and in this case particularly the supporters um, of Donald Trump, but I think this should be true for all Americans, um, you know, and I'm not exactly a Trump supporter by any means. I've been very critical of him for you know, almost the entire time that I've had this channel. Um, I've been a little more, um, um, I guess you could, you could say that I've been a little more sympathetic to him over the last couple of months with the election going on. Um, for reasons that I think are appropriate, doesn't necessarily mean that I think that he's a great guy or that he's a wonderful president. I think that the office of president in general is a bad thing and that uh, people pretty much by virtue of becoming the president of the United States uh, are guilty of some pretty bad crimes. But with that said, uh, this our system, our political system does not perpetuate itself uh, by you know ruling over a population of people who all think like me. In fact, it, the fact that I'm in an extreme minority is part of the reason why our system is allowed to work. But <laughs> more people are going to come around to my point of view if you give them reason to. If you give them reason to doubt the system, if you make it clear uh, that the uh, the system is very much one-sided. Remember back in 2016 when Jill Stein, um, acting pretty much as a proxy for uh, Democratic activists. Not, and now, note, I didn't really say the Democratic Party, although Hillary gave some tacit support uh, to her recount efforts. Uh, you didn't have Republicans. The Republican governor of uh, you know Michigan and Wisconsin, I believe both of them had re Republican governors at the time and Republican legislatures, certainly. Um, they were not trying to stop <laughs> the uh, and uh, impede the recount efforts of Jill Stein. Uh, she went forward with them. And you didn't have Republicans nationally, I don't think, um, essentially saying that it was, you know, evil and uh, an anti-American and a coup that Jill Stein was trying to do these recounts because I think they had confidence that they legitimately won the election. And in fact, uh, I believe in Wisconsin, when they did the recount, it actually ended up helping Trump uh, because they discovered that there was some, uh, it, you know, in Milwaukee, there was some... Uh, uh, Fraudulent votes, I think we could say. I believe the specific issue was you had more votes than voters in certain precincts, uh, which is always a telltale sign of ballot stuffing. But now that the shoe is on the other foot, and you have in you know many of these same states, the Republicans uh, wanting to go over everything and make sure that the election was done properly and that all of these votes are legitimate, uh, you are seeing an, uh, an unprecedented backlash. And even when you have officials who are a part of the official election process of the official certification process saying, no, there's problems here, we can't go forward with this, then being um, just browbeaten and uh, coerced, uh, to say the least, into going along with this, that there's, we're done, okay? This is over. The system cannot continue. Uh, Joe Biden is not going to be a legitimate president if he's inaugurated. Uh, if Donald Trump somehow comes back and wins, uh, you know, the well's been poisoned at this point and uh, the, nobody on the opposing side is going to recognize him either. And so this big federal behemoth uh, that has been built up over the last 100 years or so, uh, more than 100 years at this point, uh, cannot stand. And thankfully, as I, as I talked about last week, I believe, there are already governors um, going on the record saying that, uh, you know, if Joe Biden uh, gets in there and he says, we're going to do a national lockdown, they're not going along with it. Uh, and they would not have the latitude to do that if everyone just, you know, recognized Joe Biden as the legitimate president that, okay, well, he's the president now. And so we all have to do what he says. And so if Joe Biden says none of us can leave our houses, then I guess we can't do that. Then, you know, the governors would have no latitude to do that because their, you know, their, uh, their people would go along with what Joe Biden says. Um, but because uh, the, pres the office of the president of the United States has been thankfully so thoroughly degraded, and I do think that is a good thing in the long run, um, the, uh, the state governments uh, will resist such rules and other rules too if the federal government puts them in place. And I think the same thing will be true as if, you know, in four years, if, uh, you know, when Kamala Harris ultimately ascends to the throne and, and if she's not able to win election in, in, 24, in, in 2024, uh, the Republican that gets in there, a lot of the blue states are not going to listen to what he says. So I think we've, you know, effectively reached an impasse 
people are going to have to learn to go on in this country, um, you know, in spite of the federal government, not, you know, by acting in concert with it or coexisting with it. I mean, we're basically in a similar situation uh, to what Afghanistan is in right now. Afghanistan, after their last presidential election, was disputed. Uh, the incumbent, Ashraf Ghani, um, or is it Ghazni? No, I think it's Ghani. Um, he claimed that he won, and the challenger claimed that he won. So now Afghanistan, in their capital, there's two presidents running around with their own cabinets and their own loyalists. Um, and, I mean, that country is, of course, a basket case. And frankly, you know, we might have a similar situation here in the United States. You know, a lot of Republican officials, uh, they are still recognizing President Trump and saying he's not going away. Not only just Trump's cabinet, but even Kevin McCarthy today. And Kevin McCarthy is uh, a, uh, you know, he's the majority leader in the Republican House. Um, Kevin McCarthy is not some, you know, ultra right winger. He's a very, you know, uh, mainline Republican politician who will go along, get along for whatever, he, you know, he needs to do to have power. Um, he and the uh, the ch the uh, RNC chairperson, uh, uh, Rona Romney McDaniel, her name's Romney, and she's even on Trump's side. I mean, we could get to a point to where the Republican Party in mass uh, does not recognize Joe Biden be president, and they continue to go on calling uh, Donald Trump the president. Uh, to where you know certain states, Republican governors, I'd imagine my governor Ron DeSantis would be chief among them, uh, would not really recognize. Uh, orders from Washington. And again, the lockdown thing, I think, is going to be a major issue, but also other things. Let's say that Joe Biden decides to invoke uh, executive gun control. Uh, I don't think that uh, um, a lot of these states would, you know, would go along with that either. And they're latter, and they're, uh, uh, the way that they'd be able to get away with that is by saying, well, he's not a legitimate president. And so I don't know if we'd have a necessarily a hard split where you have certain states saying, okay, we're, uh, you know, we side with the Trump administration and Trump is our president, Joe Biden's not our president. Um, and they, you know, take orders from Trump and Trump runs some government in exile. I don't, <laughs> still too soon to say that. But the fact that it is a possibility at this point, even if I think it's a slim possibility, uh, is quite telling. You know, a lot of folks in the media, I think, uh, somewhat appropriately, are getting nervous that Trump is placing uh, his loyalists in the Pentagon at this point. Because it doesn't make much sense. I mean, he should have, <laughs> my criticism of this was that he should have put in his Pentagon, you know, his loyalists into the Pentagon uh, in January of 2017. So that he could have completely drained the Pentagon swamp, because the Pentagon is a horrible, horrible institution. Um, uh, it should not exist. Uh, nothing good has happened since the Pentagon was built after World War II. Uh, it is a, a, a den of scum and villainy. And uh, frankly, I'm, I still think that the only reason why Trump put these people in there is, is to try and make one last push to get the troops out of Afghanistan um, before he's out of office. That's my, that's my, <laughs> that's what I think. Uh, you know, I don't think if Douglas McGregor is in there to try and plot some coup uh, to make sure that Trump stays president after January 20th. But I do think that it is, uh, I think that it's at least appropriate to the media to ask that question at this point, uh, given the level of dispute and what's going on and how strong Trump is in saying that he's not leaving. Um, the idea that he could, you know, try and, uh, you know, again, because he's doing this, he, he did not flush out all these Pentagon people back in 2017. He's doing it right now, right before he leaves. So it's like, well, why? You're not, if you're not going to be there in the next four years, what's the point in getting rid of all these Pentagon people? You might as well just leave them in there because there's not much you can do in that time. And I, again, it's going to be very difficult to try and get the troops home out of Afghanistan and Iraq um, by January 20th. So one obvious motivation might be <laughs> that he wants to make sure that the, uh, that the military is on his side. And that when uh, he says that you know he's the legitimate president and he's not leaving at the military, at least a good chunk of them, uh, say, you know what, Mr. President, we agree. Because again, uh, you know, the reason why uh, Maduro in Venezuela is still in office is because the military was on his side. Uh, they tried to stage a coup against him and said that, you know, okay, his, his re-election was illegitimate. And Juan Guaido said, I'm the legitimate president now. Um, and the military said, no, go screw off. We like Maduro. And so, you know, the same is, can be true for Trump. If enough of the military says, uh, you know, no, we back Trump. And then Trump comes out and says, I'm not leaving. And the military doesn't force him. <laughs> well, then there's, then that's it. Trump stays president for life for however long. 
Now again, I don't think that this is likely. I'm just saying that I don't think it's totally crazy at this point uh, that uh, lefties in the media would be discussing it. I don't think that we're at the point to where the United States could see a hard split like that. Um, I don't think that there's been an, that there's enough tension yet, uh, and, and I don't think this is the right issue. But what this does do is poison the well for later on. So I think ultimately, if Trump loses all of his legal challenges, he will leave. Uh, but he'll say, you know, I'll leave uh, because you know I, I lost on a technicality or whatever in the courts, and you were able to steal it from me. Uh, but I'm not leaving because I lost the election. Essentially, I, I think how Trump would play it if he's not able to hold on here. And so from that point forward, uh, Trump and all of his supporters, um, you know, would uh, view the government as illegitimate. And that makes uh, a potential split later on down the road, you know, that much more likely. So, for example, if uh, we have the Democrats pick off these two Senate seats in Georgia and the Democrats control uh, the, the House, the Senate and the presidency, and then they decide to uh, add two states to the Union, D.C. and Puerto Rico, which would be four Democratic Senate seats. That would be the purpose of that. Um, and then they um, pack the Supreme Court and they pass like gun confiscation and stuff. Uh, I don't think that a lot of these Republican governors are going to go along with that. They're going to say, no, you're an illegitimate president. Uh, you added two states illegitimately to the Union uh, to pack the Senate. You're packing the Supreme Court totally illegitimate. And you would just have them say no. I don't know if there would be any de jure separation or anything like that or articles of secession. There might be too much um, you know, bad juju around that because of uh, the last civil war and people thinking of slavery and stuff. They might not use those terms, but that's essentially what would happen. The entire federal government could effectively be nullified. And Trump, you know, would probably step forward as uh, sort of a, uh, a spiritual national leader uh, of the resistance. Uh, to uh, you know what the uh, to what the Democrats were doing. This, I think, is a more realistic gives us a more realistic idea of how American politics are going to play out in the future on a national level, on a federal level. I don't think that <laughs> we're going back to business as usual at this point. I don't see how you can. After all that's happened this cycle, I don't think that people can just go back to accepting uh, that our elections are legitimate. People are not going to look at politics simply about, you know, oh, who won an election or who lost an election. It's going to be about, uh, it's, it's going to be much more, you know, Machiavellian and based on, you know, hey, uh, what is it that I want that I can get away with? And to the extent that uh, you can get away with something, you'll go for it. And uh, to the extent that you can't get away from it, you'll, or get away with it, you will refrain from it. And while this will be painful for a while, I think that ultimately in the, role, in the long run, uh, this will be a good thing because it will expose um, the, the inefficiencies uh, of our current highly centralized system. And our government did not start out this way. This is just how it's grown and how it's become. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of, uh, I think, malignant tumors uh, that have um, latched on uh, to our constitution as it was originally ratified, as imperfect as it was even then. Uh, it's gotten much worse, and I don't think at this point that it is uh, really functional. And I'm not saying that like from an ideological perspective that, you know, oh, it was written by slave owners, so it's bad. No, that's not my point. I'm just saying that, <laughs> uh, that I, I think that it's uh, reached the end of its useful life and that uh, the United States it, um, is no longer governable. You know, it's not like we can just uh, do away with all of these cancerous growths. Um, on the Constitution and say, okay, well, let's just go back to a pure interpretation of the Constitution as it was ratified in 1791 or 1789, I think it was technically. Because that's not on the table here. What's on the table here is are we going to go along with the system as it is progressing currently um, towards being more highly centralized, uh, towards having um, less uh, or in, in elections with less and less integrity? Or are people just going to say, no, I refuse at this point? And I think we're reaching a point to where it will become a mainstream position in this country. And it already kind of was um, under the Trump administration, even though I thought it was kind of laughable and I thought those people were unserious. But they called themselves the resistance. Uh, and language matters, even though language is not, obviously not everything. And I don't think those people did really much to resist much of anything. Um, you know, and I, I think that they, more than anything, were just standing up to try and reimpose 
the established order in America, um, or the you know the established post world or post Cold War order of uh, you know more war and and more debt things. But it is significant that they did not see Trump as a legitimate president. They didn't see George W. Bush as a legitimate president either because of the Bush v. Gore case. But now we're going to have a back-to-back -back four years where one side of the country does not recognize the sitting president. And I, I, I take the Republicans doing that much more seriously because I think the Republicans by nature, by nature being conservatives, are much more process-oriented. They care much more about the process, about the pomp and circumstance of the institution of the presidency. These are things that Republicans instinctively value, and they're not things that Democrats instinctively value. Democrats instinctively have goals that they want to achieve, and I think that that's admirable. Uh, the, I think that that's a very honest way of looking at politics. You know, hey, I have my ideology. I want to advance it. I have my own personal interests. And so how can I get about that? I don't really care what the process is. I'll go through whatever process I have to. And if I can, I'm going to skirt that process. Uh, the Republicans, though, if they see the process as being tainted, something that they hold as, you know, uh, almost sacred, and they too choose to abandon it um, in, a, in a more concrete way, um, in a more serious way, I think, than the Democrats did over the last four years, uh, then I think that, you know, we, we may just be starting to get somewhere. I think at that point, then the process, you know, really will uh, begin to break down. And so before our very eyes, I think that we are beginning to witness an acceleration of the decline of the United States. People are now very openly referring to this election as a third world election, as a banana, banana republic election. And those are not terms that you use to refer to a legitimate government that um, you know, both sides agree should exist and, and should be preserved. So I think that's about all I have to say on this issue for today. Uh, if you gain anything of value out of this video, I'd appreciate you clicking that like button and sharing this video. And if you haven't already, please do subscribe because I do upload every day and I'd hate to have you miss one. So I'll see you folks back here tomorrow.